Thank you for giving your time to be here. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Startup Grind. Yeah, happy to be here. How are you? I'm doing well. My Good. second Startup Grind event. First in a long time, though. Yeah. Um, do you want to give us a little background on where? I know you're, you're native from Hammond. You yes, obviously... native of Hammond uh, by way of New Orleans. My mother's from New Orleans. My dad's from Hammond. And so I grew up uh, between both. Uh, Hammond was a lot more rural than it is these days, growing up a lot. Um, went off to LSU for undergrad, went to Kennedy School for grad school, came back, started my first business called Solid Ground Innovations. Uh, we were primarily a strategic communications and management agency um, that grew out of uh, Baton Rouge. Um, we also had a segment of our business that focused on supporting nonprofits and large grant makers. So like Ford Foundation, Kellogg Foundation, family foundations like the Wilson Foundation here, the Pennington Foundation. Um, and we were essentially providing technical assistance or capacity support to their partners and grantees. And as we were working inside of um, that business, and particularly that segment of the business, we realized that the space was very antiquated and dated when it came to technology. And oftentimes our job was to bring capacity to these partners and organizations, but the likelihood of them continuing the work once we left was like very rare. So we brought the capacity and when we left, we left with the capacity and the work didn't continue, but millions of dollars were being, was being pushed to fund um, this type of work to consultants like myself here in Louisiana. And so I started thinking about ways we could utilize technology to productize some of our services and deliver it through a software solution. So I am definitely um, everything SaaS, <laughs> software as a service. And that gave rise to Resilia, uh, which is the tech company that I started and launched to the public at the end of 2016, like November 2016. Um, and we serve a two-sided market. On one side, those nonprofits and partners that we were servicing before. And then on the other side, we support funders. So anyone mm. deploying capital, cities, private foundations, corporations, um, anything that really that deploys capital. And from that company, we've been um, pretty successful in raising capital, almost $11 million to date from a number of investors from Mucker Capital out of LA to most recently SoftBank um, to the Calais family here in Louisiana. You know, a lot of our money was actually raised early on, was actually raised out of Louisiana. So don't let them tell you they don't have money here because okay. I raised a couple million dollars here. Uh, and then we have a number of smaller investors throughout the Southeast between Atlanta and Chattanooga. And so we have grown as a company over the past few years. Um, we'll probably be around 48 people by the end of this year, currently sit around 32. Um, yeah, I have an office here, well, in Louisiana, based in New Orleans. And we have another office where mostly of our R&D team sits in Bryant Park. Very so nice. Bit, Very nice. Brian Park. New York. New York. Yeah. New York. Um, so we're going to get into the raise and, 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 you know, how you guys just went through that and, and had a lot of publicity. Um, I became aware of you through uh, Brew this year. So as soon as Brew happened, I picked the phone up. I started calling everyone at, at, at the tech park. I'm going to go, who is this? <laughs> who, who is Savitri Wilson? She's the keynote speaker. Why? I've never heard of her. Um, and then I immediately started emailing, you know, to try to get connected. Um, before you, before we get into like the raise and some of those details, what got you into Solid Ground? What, what was, in Solid Ground, it was the consulting yes. agency for nonprofits mm -hmm. to help with their capacity or, or, or yeah. for not a number of things, yeah. but what led to that? So what was right before that? If you don't mind. Yeah. College. College. Okay. <laughs> um, so I came right out of college and I was working at CASA. So court appointed special advocates for foster children who've been in and out of foster care. And um, at CASA, I was doing a lot of their stakeholder development. I was also advocating at the Capitol for foster children. And through that work, um, I was a part of the Forgotten Children campaign. And our campaign, the face of our campaign was Dr. Phil, because he was really big back then. And so Dr. Phil was the face of the campaign of Forgotten Children. Looking back, maybe, I don't know if that was successful. <laughs> Probably would have had a better person than Dr. Phil, but he was very big back yeah. then. Um, and so I got to work between Baton Rouge and DC on that campaign. Um, and from there, people started to reach out to me to help build out a lot of their program and curriculum. And so that got me into the space of working with other nonprofits and foundations. 
And so had opportunity to leave and kind of break off on my own and start a consultancy agency um, through that route. And we started with nonprofits, but we eventually began to branch out. Um, and we started doing everything from like government contracting work to, you know, we were leading communications for, for CC's Coffee and House. So this started with what, just you? Just, yeah, just Just me. you, just okay. Me. How'd you bring on your first team member? Or how many team members did my you have? My first team member was actually my sorority sister. And I'm okay. actually generally not a big person about hiring friends sometimes, but Hey, my co-founder is my killer. fraternity brother. Yeah, yeah. hey, oh, it, yes. You yeah. got something in common. It's there's good and bad, you know. There's, yeah. there's good and bad. But there. she was just a logistics like dynamite at logistics. Yeah. And I was like, "Want to come work for me?" She was like, "Yeah, let's do it." Awesome. <laughs> and that's how we started. Awesome. And then, so then, what was the moment where so Resilia, the company? Mm -hmm. Can you give a little detail into what Resilia does? Yes. And and what led you to building Resilia, which I believe was a different brand before. It was. Okay. So we rebranded to Resilia about two years ago from Exempt Me Now. And okay. so originally we were doing something really simple and we were essentially turbo taxing the process of incorporation and exemption of nonprofits because mm. we were doing this manually inside of solid ground. And so we we're like, oh, we're going to take this and productize it and deliver across all 50 states. And so we did that. And then those customers started asking for other services. And in asking for those other services, we we're like, oh, how can we turn morph this into a subscription based product? Yeah. And that is what evolved to Resilia. And so our Exempt Me Now product is still in existence, but it's only like 10% of our revenue today, yeah. right? And so people are like, oh, guys, you know, cost me shit. I'm like, don't call me. Just go online and click a button. Yeah. <laughs> Not for that service. It's changed a lot over the years. Yeah, huh? it's yeah. changed. Now we have pre three products in market, um, that Very formation nice. service of starting a nonprofit. Then we have existing nonprofit platform for just existing organizations and then our funder platform. Could you imagine that it came to where it is today? Like, like if looking back, like, was that... Was that the vision or and how much did it? Hell yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You just got to start out to do small stuff. <laughs> okay, okay. You got to uh, scale. That's the goal. When, um, so let's talk about scale. When, when was that moment that you realized, I need more team, I need, I need, I need more capacity, and yeah. you started going after? Uh, yes, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't put any more money of my own money into this company. Yeah. <laughs> if we're gonna, if we're gonna use software to essentially democratize uh, philanthropy in this space, I'm gonna have to go out and seek capital to do it because it was too expensive, right? Um, engineers trying to build ahead of um, market and trying to capture a significant portion of the market is just expensive to do. Yeah. Um. Look, so so. When do you think that, if at all, you reached your so your product market fit? So, mm -hmm. so the idea that you your product's validated, it's exactly what they want. Is um, it ever? Is it ever? No, no, <laughs> no one's ever happy, right? No one, no one, completely happy. But um, did that come to you before? So, so was that was that the confidence to go out and raise that? Hey, this is this product's needed. Mm -hmm. The problem's there. We are the solution. We just want to do more of it. Um, or did you go out? Because you said you poured some of your own money in. I did. I don't have any more money to put in. So it was. We had a minimum we, viable product when we okay. went out to raise capital. Gotcha. And we gotcha. raised originally $400,000 in a pre seed round from local investors. Got it. Um, here in Louisiana. And yeah, we had a minimum viable product and, a, and I had a deck. And most my early investors were people I had met along the way in like business. Um, and so they were like, yeah, I think if you did this other thing, you probably could do this thing. So. You know, yeah. and they kind of wrote me a check based on um, my past performance, right? Yeah. So, um, I think I think the 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 MVP discussion, like the minimum viable product, like like here's the thing we should make before we make the thing we want to make, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how important was that? You know, did you have guidance that you went out and said, "Hey, I'm only going to make the MVP," or or "Hey, this is or just like this, all have money for," you know? <laughs> what, 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 what were there any intention behind that? Because I'm always curious because. I, I want to know, did everyone just le read the Lean Startup book or did, or did some people just build what they could? You know, mm -hmm. what, what, what happened there? Um, I pretty much built what I could. Gotcha. Yeah. And was fortunate to my marketing director at the time at SGI had went to Stanford um, and he was like, oh, I have this buddy that's an engineer because I'm not technical. So right. that's like an X you know, yeah. <laughs> on my founder chart uh, when raising capital. But he's like, let's how many, fly out. How many people in here are technical? Or you would call yourself technical founders, potentially? 
Yeah, no. no. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And so I went to San Francisco to meet this guy named Ishmael. Um, and over the course of a couple of days, he helped me create a like 25 page specifications deck with wireframes okay. um, of what became my, ultimately became my MVP and what we would go on to, to develop and build. Awesome. Um, and so found the team to build it and kind of never looked back after that. Love that. Um, looking back, do you think that, how important was this 25 page specification doc. Like, it wasn't important no. for my investors, but it was important for the engineering team being non technical. Yeah. And a lot of people were impressed. They were like, this is good. Like, it basically gave them the roadmap, right? right of what needed to happen. Yeah. So it was, it was good. Love that. <laughs> um, and so, so when you go out to raise, um, it's people you meet along the way. Yes. Um, what was the thought process when you went to raise? And I'll say specifically, knowing how much, mm -hmm. knowing what I'm going to use it for and what vehicle I use to raise. So whether, you know, do I give a percentage of my company or do I use a convertible note? You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know I'm curious, how, how, did you, how did you kind of make some of those decisions? So we raised on a safe. So um, most people call it like secured agreement for future equity originally. Mm -hmm. And... We raised money, as I mentioned before, locally, but the amounts were based on what was generally being raised in our space at the time. Now it's all over the place. People are raising like $20 million C rounds, 50 million. This is crazy yeah. what people are raising. I'm like, Jesus, are you diluting yourself that much? Or your valuation is 50, $500 million? I don't know. But for me, we were raising capital based on um, trying to sustain ourselves for 18 months. So everything was based on 18 months okay. of what we would need to, before we needed to raise again. And ideally what would get us to that next big milestone okay. that would trigger another raise. And so $400,000 pre-seed, $2 million seed, and then we just raised um, $8.7 million in a Series A. Congratulations, by the way. Thank that's you. That's big, that's big. Um, it's not easy raising capital here in Louisiana. No. Uh, some, you know, some would say, yeah, obviously it can be done, and mm -hmm. and we know I really do applaud you for for doing it. And I think you made a big splash by raising the amount that you did. So mm -hmm. kudos to you. Um, but not only that, you know, for minority and women founders, this is, I mean, you you just you just went ahead and said screw it, um, we'll do whatever, uh -huh. what everyone didn't. Um, was there any thought in, into that? Like, like, was there an acknowledgement? Hey, I know what I'm about to get into. Um, and can you, can you can you talk through maybe some of it, hurdles at all that, that you had to deal with? Yeah, so I think about um, in general, you know, person of color, woman from the south, non technical, and I'm a solo founder. Yeah. So I had like five strikes against me. <laughs> <laughs> what was going for you at this time? Exactly. <laughs> They're like, you know, your space. And that's like, what was going for me. Great. They're like, you're an expert in your space. So it's nothing that we can't, you're telling us what's the correct information, right? And so no one could argue me down right. or really beat me on the facts, right, of our space. I knew my numbers, like, cold, you know, yeah. all the diligence questions we blew through. Yeah. And so I think that that really helped me raise capital. And of all the rounds, my C round was the hardest round. And a lot of people say their C round is the hardest round. How, how so? Um, because you're in that, you're at that um, inflection point, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, you need this extra money, but you don't, you're kind of, you don't really have going to market fit. You, you're just like, okay, we're going to market, yeah. but we don't really have product market fit just yet, but we're almost there. And we have, if we get this infusion of capital, we can really get there. We have customers. So it definitely shows it, but it's all about predictable repeatable revenue when you think about SaaS right, and right. ideally large contracts. And so our vision for the future was this funder platform where our minimum contract is $20,000 a year. Our largest contract is seven figures a year. And so investors love that, right? Yeah. And we're like, okay, well, we need this money to be able to get there. And so we had as that mix of trying to convince people, right, that we could continue to scale up in our space. Um, and so, you know, today investors reach out to us all like every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. But so then, like, when are you raising it? When are you raising it? Good? Yeah, but then it wasn't the case. We were like, I was chasing investors and I knew in order to raise $2 million that early, I wasn't going to be able to raise it in Louisiana. And so okay. I had to go out and raise capital and bring it back, which was even harder. Yeah. Um, 
And because it's so much about like your network and who you're connected with. And I was a little bit behind the eight ball and like building those relationships. So what, what, that's so that's interesting. To me. What was the process in going and meeting or being introduced to? Like, well, let me ask you. So Muck Capital, Mucker, Mucker Capital yeah. is is Ledger Round, Ledger Round. They led. They were uh, a co lead with uh, Calais out of, out of and Did you go out pursue them specifically? They actually pursued me. Very nice. Um, okay. But that was my Series A. My seed round. What was interesting, uh, what turned my seed round around was actually a guy named Tim Milliken from TPG Capital, which is a private equity firm out of San Francisco. Yeah. And I was talking to someone earlier about, I did culture pitch for New Orleans Entrepreneur Week and I lost, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but you know, my guys, they won. Um, but it was a great pitch. Never, you for, know? never forget. <laughs> yeah. Never gonna let it but down. But everybody that loses the pitch competition is always going to have the best company. It's like the biggest successes. <laughs> That's just a fact. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah. That. Historically, that. Lucid, um, Z Lean, which is no level set, we all lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but Tim Milliken happened to be on my call. So they matched some of their partners with the startups yeah. uh, to do pitch practices. Yeah. And he happened to be on my call. Um, and then when I lost, I sent them an email, the whole group of emails saying, sorry guys, but thanks for your help. Didn't pull this on through for the team. And he was like, oh, whenever you're in San Francisco, look me up. Maybe we can catch up. I thought you had a great um, business. Couple months passed by. I'm like dragging along. I think I'm never going to raise this capital. And I was going to San Francisco for a conference, and I just happened to reach out to him. And it was like, yes, let's meet up. We went to lunch. Um, and you know, Tim Milk is like one of the biggest private equity investors. Like he leaves hundred million dollar rounds. And he was like, I'm going to write a check into your into your round. And his name being on my cap table turned my entire round around. Like I raised mm -hmm. the money like that after that. That is awesome. So so, so it was momentum. So the yeah. FOMO, FOMO is real. And, FOMO is real. And raising money. And investors just follow people. That's real too. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they say investors are lazy. They, they want yeah. other people to do the work, do the due diligence, and just tell me, should I put money in? Are you going to put money in? That's what investor asks all investors. Did you put money in? That's okay, what great. I should too. <laughs> when someone introduces a founder to another uh, investor and just the founder, yeah. they always ask that question. Did you invest? How has it been since you raised? Like I, what, My what, last Series A? Yeah. yeah. Um, so since the 8 million, you know, what's been going on? How, how is, how, what is it like deploying that capital into the company now uh, at this scale? Yeah. I mean, we, it allowed us to hire more rapidly and actually build out a real sales team. Yeah. Um, and that's been going really well. And for us, it was about um, like expanding and also product R and D, building out our team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hired a real CTO and all that great stuff. And you know, we formalized our board, and so we really began to put the structure in place uh, to scale up the company. Gotcha. Um, and we expanded and started hiring pretty rapidly, right? Mm -hmm. So we went from a very small team, and within like a year's time now, I guess a year had hired over, you know, almost 30 people. Yeah. And so we were doing this during COVID with our offices closed. Are y'all hiring locally? Yeah, we hire locally in New Orleans. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. How, um, and the talent, has the talent been there for you? Yes. I think that for us, the challenge in Louisiana is engineering and sales. Okay. Um, you can find the engineers, but people don't like leaving where they are. Whereas we don't, we, we're just starting to see people move around, like people from Lucid leaving, people from Level Set, like looking for their next opportunity right. because they've hit, um, either they hit a ceiling or they're no longer getting like options, right? So they're coming into the company now and they've missed the boat of early right. stage. And so when they see other early stage opportunities, they may leave um, and go into those companies. But now we're just getting enough um, startup activity where they have companies where they can leave that job and go and join a new startup. Yeah. Uh, so we're starting to see the activity now. So that's a good thing. Do, do you, um, people that work in startups so that, you know, so now you're saying people are starting to move around. Is, is that the case where there's maybe, you know, the, um, you know, the, the lifespan of, of a startup worker is only a certain period of time? Yeah. Unless you haven't invested yet. Okay. Most people might stay around to invest and then they'll, they might jet after that, depending sure. on how, how's your team schedule. been, you know, um, for, I mean, obviously you, you just start growing it, but do you still have a lot of the early members or yes. have, are you just switch? Are you just 
moving No, we around. have a lot of our early members. Um, I think that our culture is really good in our company. Yeah. Um, like we just had a team fun day today. And for our team fun day, our R&D team did a hackathon where they all, they divided into three teams and they did a design project around a feature that they would want. And so each of them presented their new feature um, that they had built over the past like 48 hours. Nice. And it was really good. I was like, bravo, we're going to build this. Yes. <laughs> we should build, we're going to add this to the roadmap. <laughs> and it was making it, you think? Yeah, we're going to make it. We're going to definitely that. make at least two features that they love presented. That. Love that. Um, okay, so let's, so for a moment, let's just, so staying on capital, um, is there anyone here that, that has been, you know, thinking of, of, of raising uh, or, you know, when you think, you think about, when you think about, you know, starting a startup, you know, one of the issues is raising money. Um, if, is there any specific tips you would give to someone that's looking to raise or questions you, you think, you know, as startups or early stage companies, we should ask ourselves before we really, you know, jump in? Yeah, I think it's about like how, where you are today and where do you need to go next? Because I think mm. sometimes we think so far ahead and we're like, I need to raise all this money. And it's like, do you really need to yeah. raise all this money or could you raise X amount to get you to this next goal and then this next goal? Um, but ultimately, um, if you're thinking about raising capital, definitely relationships, getting connected. Um, I think one of the keys to closing money is having like your diligence together. Like okay. your diligence room, um, your data room, and having it just like locked tight. Um, because I think a lot of startups die <laughs> in, due uh, in due diligence. Yeah. A hundred percent. Have the answers ready. Yeah. Just, or respond quickly, not days later. Yeah. You know, or weeks later or whatever the case may be. Because a lot of startups die in due diligence. It, um, okay. So we're, we're going to take one, one turn here into, into data. I, I'm curious mm -hmm. about this. Um, one thing, one thing we've been doing in the last week and a half, okay, is I'm trying to get much more ingrained in the day-to-day -day progress, whether it's zero or a little bit, mm -hmm. of here are the numbers today, right? Here's where we are. Um, but as, as founders, what, are there any day-to-day -day actions that you think, hey, these, I, I, do, I do X, Y, and Z daily, whether I like it or I don't like it, that that's mm -hmm. building my company for the future help, whether that's to communicate a vision, mm -hmm. whether to get everyone aligned around what our goals are, you know, daily targets, weekly targets. Um, if so, so are there any daily habits that you take on that you, that you feel have, you know, um, been very beneficial? Um, <laughs> Getting sales. <laughs> Getting sales. But not even early, right? I think that it is definitely, for me, aligning uh, the team around a vision. Um, I always have a check-in with at least three times a week with one of my senior leadership um, team members, whether okay. that's like Ash, who's my VP of revenue, whether it's Blue, who's my CTO. Uh, we always do check-ins. We start Monday off with like a 15-minute check-in. Um, we have our all hands, which is only 30 minutes. Um, and so some things are just reoccurring, right, right. that I already know I'm looking forward to. Um, my chief of staff and I always go through like my target hit list um, on Mondays and that kind of sets the tone for my week. Right. Um, but I think it's like how you're positioning your startup for success is so important, particularly early on. But it's all everything really is relative to right. what is next for you? What right. are you trying to do in this moment, right? right? Are you trying to attain more users? Are you trying to get more traction? Are you yeah. trying to just get on people's radar? And so based on like what your objective is, that should really be like your focus. Right. Um, it, so so when, when those little think, targets that you're trying to hit, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on testing ideas, mm -hmm. you know? Um, because I, I feel that I'm in this constant, constant back and forth in test. Hey, we're we're doing A/B testing on this email, you know, button. Is it colored? Is it not colored? Mm -hmm. You know, do we're doing another testing. You know, after we pick one, what's the word of the button? Then we're doing the testing on where is the button, and we're just like it's constant. Yeah. But um, i I feel that one thing I've taken from some founders has been, don't get stuck on the tactic you chose. Be okay that it doesn't work. Yeah. You, how often does that happen in, you know, for you? Like, 
you know, hey, you, you choose this, this goal, you, you put together the plan, um, you know, how far along do you go until you abandon ship, right? Until you start making changes. Yeah, I'm a big believer of like failing fast. So um, we do a lot of testing, like whether that's marketing, um, UX, UI, discovery around product. Right. Um, but at some point you have to hit go. And I think mm -hmm. that sometimes you can get like caught up in the weeds just going back and forth over things that probably don't even matter that much today. And so if I see my team like going around in circles around something, I'm like, guys, what are you doing? Like, yeah. go, go, like, get it done. Like, figure it out later. It'll, if it, if it breaks, it breaks. Like, keep going, yeah. you fix it. Fix you it know? when it breaks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you just get. Don't you, get caught in planning. Exactly. Yeah. And planning or just thinking and thinking and thinking. It's like, you have to hit the go Think button. while you go. Yeah. Think while you go. I'd rather you just like fail or like breaks than for you to take an extra two weeks. Like we lose time in the process, right? right? And so some things like you just have to have right, but at the end of the day, when you're launching something, you gotta know where you launch it, that's for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, how, many, uh, how many team members do you think really come together for a product for you to, to, to go live? So you, you're, you have a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. It used to be just you and a few other yeah. people, right? and that's like everybody. I'm like, what's yeah. going on? Um, <laughs> So can you take us back to when there was maybe just a few people? What were the things that you were focusing on? Um, and, and I say that just so that we can, because you know, for, the, for the stage that the, of people that are going to be listening to this mm -hmm. um, and who are going to be kind of sharing this with, um, how are you focusing on what you need to get done when it's only three to five people? Yeah, I mean, you have to wear multiple hats. I think that's just like, the founder journey that you have to kind of get comfortable with. Right. And people often feel, they might feel overwhelmed, but I hate to be very Elon Musk about it. It's kind of like, fuck it up. <laughs> you know, like it is what it is. Like you have to wear multiple hats right. to like get things done. And eventually if you do those things well, then you'll be able to hire people to take things off of your plate. Um, so that people who are actually probably a lot better than you can do those things. Um, but early on, it's just like, that is the nature of the beast with startups that you just have to wear so many different um, um, hats and do so many different roles at once. But ultimately, um, if you're prioritizing something, you're obviously prioritizing your product and then you're prioritizing the thing that's going to bring you traction. Yeah. Um, as we prioritize and we do the day to day, we have to be we like like consistency. Did consistency play a big part in you achieving your success? Yes, I do feel that I'm a very consistent person. It doesn't mean that I don't fail because I fail a lot. Right. <laughs> um, but I do feel like I'm consistent when it comes to okay, that didn't work. What do I need to do next? Right. right to get back on track. When when do you decide to let go of an idea? Um. Because when I, it's not going anywhere okay. and when, it, when it's going to be a hindrance on future success. Okay. And I think that that is something, um, sometimes you have to let it play out, but for the most part, eh, sometimes I feel like people know, they just kind of ignore their gut instinct. Yeah. Cause I, you know, cause I, the, I think one of the hardest things for early stage founders is that we, we have this idea. It's our baby. It's the thing we've been working mm -hmm. on. It's, whether or not we asked a bunch of people or we, you know, we came up with it in a, in a, in a room somewhere, you know, in a notepad. Um, it, have you done anything to help you, you know, detach yourself from, from the idea, from, you know, any kind of emotional attachment to this feature or, or the plan to allow you to, to continue? Yeah. So I'm definitely a big believer of, um, you know, hiring people who are just like smarter than me. Sure. all together and like I always tell my team they'll look for me for I'm like why are you looking for me for the answer on this like I literally hire you to lead this department like yeah. you tell me what I should be doing and I set the vision for the overall uh, company and where we're going and even um the product vision but if you're telling me because you're in it every single day that it's not working then I'm going to actually take that into consideration and then we probably need to go back to the table and see if that's the best route to go to. And right. sometimes it's just that that's not the priority because our, our customers are telling us something different. Mm. And so if we're receiving something, we're feeling something, we're seeing it, all my salespeople are telling me my product is aligning with my sales, which doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> and so I must be wrong, right? I must have gotten it wrong. And so I'm really um, accepting 
someone coming to the table with a better idea, with yeah. a better way to actually um, execute something as well. Um, has there been a moment where you followed your gut on, on an idea? Hey, everything said no, everything said this is not gonna work. The, you know, the feedback said no. Um, has there been a moment where you've just pushed through regardless? Yeah, I okay. started a company. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, I mean, early on, because you're getting no's, right? And so sure. those no's are telling you that we don't like this idea. We don't think there, there's a market. The market's not big enough. The market's saturated, you know? So those are things that you're fighting against in general. Um, and so when you have that coming towards you, you have to make a decision to either keep moving forward or to say, well, maybe this isn't the thing, right? Right. So yeah, I guess my, my whole company, because I always say 10 years ago, our product couldn't exist, but today we're in the right time, the right place with the right product. Absolutely. Um, and in Louisiana, what is, uh, I ask everyone this, what is keeping you in Louisiana outside of friends and family? What keeps Brasilia in mm -hmm. Louisiana. The reason why every other startup stays is because at the end of the day, if we all get money and we leave, then you never create the ecosystem, right? right. And so if we stay when we get capital and if we stay and we build, then we begin to build this ecosystem of startups where we have more talent, where we're able to attract more talent, where we're able to um, increase um, the living wage because we can pay people yeah. more. And so if you really want to build um, or be a part of building economy, being a part of giving people a better quality of life, then you kind of have to stay right. if that's what you care about. And so that's something that I care about. So I made a very strategic um, you know, goal and plan to stay here in Louisiana. We have an office in New York, um, but that's because we need to, at the time, we needed to um, expand our talent base where right. we're pulling from. Um, but I was still committed to stay in Louisiana. I was like, oh, now my New York team, who's been at all these different startups at Series C, D, they're teaching my team in New Orleans, you know, what it means to work inside of a Series C, D and like scale a startup. Right. And so I think that has been a great blend for us. What, um, so for, for everyone in Louisiana then, then that is seeking to start a company or starting to scale, are there any, were there any resources or, um, groups, communities that along the way mm -hmm. that you, you would say, hey, make sure to reach out, make sure to connect with them uh, and make good use of what's available here. Yeah. So I came through just the, you said you found out about me via Brew. And then we talked about like a New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, um, Idea Village. I think that's like the base of what you have to get involved into those ecosystems because right. you have to put yourself around people who are building and oftentimes we're like in the silo, we're like siloing ourselves yeah. off and which makes it a lot harder. And so you have to put yourself in the ecosystem that does exist here and be a part of like growing it. But then you also have to connect to like other founders and other places and spaces too, because that also brings in just a new way, a way of ideas and seeing what other people are doing um, at different levels. So I think that that is something that is super important. Organizations, Slack channels. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to be a part of, there's this website called Founders Library, which you, you could type in anything and it returns anything you could imagine. Yeah. Uh, so that's, those are like great resources. Firstround.com, um, the old school. First, first round, founderslibrary.com, both great. I'll add those to, I'll, yeah. I'll follow up, share those with everyone. Absolutely. The oldies, like Black The Combinator. oldies? That's the old oh, Black okay. Oh, we call them oldies now? Like, yeah. Okay. Are they out, outdated? No, no. Black Combinator, they don't know they're outdated. <laughs> Um, and, and so where do you think that Louisiana is, uh, lacking behind in those resources, in those, because I think, you know, part of the mission and, you know, we all, you know, Hey, I think whether we say it or not, you know, we, we want to stay right. And then mm -hmm. we make the commitment to, um, what are the things that we should be looking to, uh, influence to improve here in the state? Where, where do you think we're, we're, we're lacking? Well, most people will say like we're lacking because we don't have funding, yeah. right? But in New Orleans, we're trying to create another um, economic driver outside of hospitality right. and tourism. Um, and so I think that that is something that a lot of founders are um, committed to do. Um, I'm part of this group called Crew de New, which is like a gang of uh, startup founders, like basically 
all of the top business owners in New Orleans are a part of like this group called Crew to New. Um, and we come together and we think about ways that we can help with recruitment, how we can influence education right. to create a pipeline earlier yeah. um, for our businesses. Uh, we partner like with Ganoff and others to do that, um, to pull from different colleges. And so there is some like intentional work being done. Um, okay. We probably could pick up the pace a little bit, but. I think we could, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, so and, and coming out of the pandemic, is there is there something attractive about Louisiana that, you know, we, we could all emphasize, you know, um, it, how, how do we, how do we kind of, you know, start getting more, cause obviously there's, there's, there's benefits to moving here. There's yeah. benefits to being here. Um, is there anything that, that, that we should start emphasizing and, and talking about more, uh, that would drive people here? You think? Well, it's opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have to make sure the opportunity is there. Um, everyone that comes to Louisiana, people that I know, some people want to stay here and they only leave because they have to find another opportunity, right? right. They don't feel like they have opportunity here to stay. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we have to create the jobs. We have to create the opportunity, um, that does attract people here. Fortunately, uh, with COVID-19, with people going with a pandemic, people being able to work from anywhere. I know so many friends and people who are working at Amazon, Google, and they move back to New Orleans. They move back to Louisiana. Right. Yeah. And so that's great because then we could like post those people from their jobs because they get comfortable and then they start mosing around. They start coming to Startup Grind. They're yeah. like, oh, this is pretty cool. And so Absolutely. that's what I'm hoping that we benefit from the pandemic is this wave of people who can live anywhere deciding to come back here or deciding to come home. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for staying here. I want to thank you for the story that you've built. And, 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 you know, one that the second I saw, I was like, I, I, we have to find a way to, to bring her to, to start grind. Um, so what, what are, if, you know, so now that we're, we're coming to a close, what, what is, you know, um, one or two things that you would you would leave the, the founders of of Baton Rouge of Louisiana, but but really our region with uh, things we, we should think about or act upon as yeah. we move forward out of out of the pandemic and into what I think is a, a moment of opportunity uh, to make a name for ourselves. So I would say it's about like coming together more, okay. right? So you're very um, you emphasize creating a in real life experience because although virtual is cool it's nothing like the energy and innovation that happens when people come together who are like like-minded who want to create innovation who want to bounce an idea off of someone else about their company like to me that's where like true innovation happens when people come together yeah. and so just emphasizing for people to I know it's hard to take those PJs off, you know, uh, me too. I've been like joggers from the waist down for the past 12 months. Yeah. So you got, you got to do it though. You have yeah. to do it. You got to come back into the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much for, for coming out. Um, is there a way that some people, everybody here can contact yes. you or reach out to yes. you? Yes. So you can follow me anywhere, but Savitra at Resilia.com. I know that's, it's my first name. Uh, at resilia.com. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll also, we'll also share, uh, share with everyone. Um, so thank you. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, so thank you for coming out yeah, today. Thanks yeah, thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you all for coming as well. Absolutely. Appreciate it.